All right, how's it going? My name is Kevin Deers, and I'm back here with Thomas Eric from the Fall of Troy. Uh, and and first off, that's how I pronounce it, right? Eric, Thomas Eric. Um, Eric. 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 It's, okay, it's, you know what? It's Croatian. That's awesome. Right on, man. Um, so first off, uh, how are you doing tonight, man? You're you're outside. You're up in Mukilteo area. Is that right? I'm no, no. I live in the U District. Never mind. Never mind. You're from yeah. Mukilteo, but you live in the yes. U District. Um, yes, beautiful yes. night tonight. Very, very. Uh, how have you been the last few months? Been a crazy. I mean, safe to say we've all been going through it. Uh, what's What's kept you um, motivated? What's kept you busy? How have you been? Uh, you know, staying sane during these pandemic times. Um, well, you know, I've been lucky enough, I think, to, uh, I have, I'm lucky enough to have, like, people around me that, that believe in me a lot, and it came to a point, like, with the, with the, with the pandemic thing and the lockdown, where everybody started to go kind of crazy, and, um, I don't know if you know my buddy, uh, Dan Schmidt, he's friends with Jake and stuff, Okay. He's, like, um, he was in, like, Filthy Nun with him, and he was in, like, Blackout Media, and, Anyways, he's a fantastic, like, uh, like multi instrumentalist, um, also uh, engineer. Oh, so, cool! Um, I was going through some changes with the solo record I've been working on, um, kind of in the background over the last almost year, I'd say. And the guy I was making it with, because the I'm trying to give you the short run of the long story, it's like. Uh, with the solo thing, the guy I was recording my solo record with, we just, we weren't vibing because he's more of like, um, like a, you know, have your shit together, come in, you know, record for 10 days, knock that shit out and then mix for four days and there's your full length in two weeks. And the thing when I'm recording by myself is, is the complete opposite. It's like, I go, okay, give me, give me a quick track at 128 and then I get behind the drum set and I make up a song on the drum set. Oh wow! Uh, very improvisational. Yeah, very much. But try to but try to reel it in. You know, try to make a song structure. Um, and then I'll play as much as I can until I fuck up, and then I'll punch in if I have to. Sometimes I just play a whole song. You know, like and then same thing happens when we have the drum tracks all done. Then I get on the bass and I just make up bass lines over the drums. And then by the time that happens, then we get to guitars and I kind of know where I'm headed with guitars and I kind of improv slash know where I'm headed with guitars. And then it's by the time guitars are done, I'm kind of already narrative, the narrative, I can feel the narrative. I can feel what it, how, it's, how the music is um, taking me. And then I write the lyrics and you know, we put in auxiliary percussion and stuff like that. And that's how I do my solo music. That's how I did. Uh, I did a little EP called The Whole Story that's on Bandcamp. Nice. Um, Bandc uh, Thomasarak.bandcamp.com. There's a, there's a, there's a six, five or six song original EP called The Whole Story. And then there's a three song because I had a, an extra couple of days in the studio. Yeah. Where I did I did a, a Weezer cover off Pinkerton. Nice. I did a I did a cover of uh, Garbage. I'm only only happy when it rains. And I did a cover of uh, um, an old an old Sam Cooke song. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and put those out, and I and I put those songs out, and that wasn't like super serious. I just was going through a time in my life where. I lived a bunch of places, gone through a bunch of heartache, and I was like, uh, you know what, I'm just going to put up a GoFundMe and see if I can raise, you know, $5,000 to go, you know, make music and just kind of get this out of me. And I raised that five grand in like one day, and I had to like change it to eight grand, and then, you know, I had to change it again. So I ended up raising, you know, about close to 10 grand just to go make this little EP. And so um, very little of it I had written you know like mm -hmm. um and it was an experiment and it was fun i wanted to see how well i could i could make an album by myself and i did that um and then um we had kind of experimented like on muckle t earth we had kind of experimented with this process even prior to that because 
uh, my project Pushover, which is uh, a project where it's just me doing all the instruments with my buddy Kurt Travis from A Lot Like Birds and um, and Dance Gavin Dance. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to follow me a little. There's been a lot of I'm stuff following, there, man. But but more or less, it's been me playing all the instruments, making shit up, kind of off off the cuff, and then doing this or doing that. And um, and then I challenged Andrew, our drummer in the fall of Troy, because we recorded a bunch of old songs from back when we were way younger that our fans always want us to like redo and stuff. Okay. And we, we did those, we recorded those at Robert Lang. And then we still needed to fill, um, cause what happened was we recorded OK, which was our last release back in 2017. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to get together at our buddy Johnny's basement, you know, do pre-production, Yada, da, 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 da. then end up at Robert Lang, re-record it all and, and put that out. Well, by the time we were done in the basement, we went, we're not re-recording these songs. This is, this is the album. This is, this is it. We're not. And, and, the, and Johnny was like, well, what are you going to do with the extra time at Robert Lang? I was like, we're going to make, we're going to make another album. There you go. Know, we're we're going to do, I was like, we'll go back and we'll go record this old stuff that we never actually recorded. Um, we'll reimagine it and, and kind of, um, you know, actually be able to pull off what we're trying to do. Yeah. And then, and then we'll do this process. We'll see if we could do it as a band where it, I told Andrew this, this process I had done um, with Pushover where I was like, yeah, I just, uh, you know, click track, play, write a song on drums and then just take it all up from there, you know? And I actually learned that uh that idea is blink 182 when they came back and they did their self-titled album like mm -hmm. um after enema like the one they actually wrote with travis yeah um, that's how they did that album like travis just tracked hours and hours and hundreds of hours of drums and they edited them, them all together to make super dope drum tracks and then they wrote the songs based off of the drum tracks so that's why all the all the drums and stuff on that Blink record are like, it just has this more, it's more serious and exciting, you know? So yeah. I kind of, I kind of have been experimenting with that process because it just, I don't know how to explain it. I think it, improv's always been a big thing for me because my dad was, you know, a funk kind of jazz, mm -hmm. rock, R&B musician. And I always thought improv was an important thing, but what if you could actually capture like the songwriting, but also the improv, like at the moment that it's happening on a record, you know? Like no guitar solo on any of my records is ever written. It's just, you know, we'll, we'll do mul multiple takes and sometimes kind of splice certain pieces together if we have to, but I'd like to get as, as big of a body of work that I possibly can before something fucks up and we have to go back and punch in. So is, if that's making any sense, Oh, it yeah, makes yeah. sense to me. So, um, the so the record Muckle Tearth uh, is yeah. is going to be coming out August eighth. Uh, that's the new Fall of Troy record. Um, and yeah. then and then of course we're talking about your solo record. Um, yeah. What uh what did you finish first? And um, uh, yeah. So which one uh which one is coming out first, and which one did you finish first? I mean, Muckle Tearth has been done technically, like it's been recorded since not too long after okay just because like i said uh you know we used the studio time at robert lang like we were supposed to record the demos at our buddy's house take a couple weeks off okay meet up at robert lang then re-record okay and okay. then put it out but instead of that like we were like this is the album this is okay so then we took a break and we ended up in robert lang and i just started throwing all these wacky ideas at the guys and, and it kind of happened you know so without giving too much away do you know when this is going to air perhaps um probably in the next couple of days um like so before before the album comes mm -hmm. out? yeah it's going to be it's going to be like a couple of days before the album because the album's coming out next friday so it'll it'll definitely be out by monday well i'll give you i'll give you a little more than i've given everybody else just okay. because like we had before we were the fall of troy we put out a little demo thing back when we were like in high school or just out of high school called Martyrs Among the Casualties, which was like a six song uh, thing that we just recorded at my dad's buddy's, you know, little crappy studio. And for what it was, 
it was pretty good. And we'd hand it out at shows or we'd burn CDs and we'd go play the Paradox and we'd sell them for five bucks, you know? And it got pretty popular. It sounds um, like a very metalcore name, is that right? Was it was it pretty metalcore? The Thirty Years War. The Martyrs Among what was it? Martyr Martyrs Among the Casualties. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty metalcore name. It it, it kind of does, but at the same time, we were um, we were having an identity crisis at the beginning because we really wanted to sound like this. We wanted to sound like this band called the Appleseed Cast. If you've ever. Heard oh yeah, I know the Appleseed Cast. Yeah. Yeah, like almost like a like an almost instrumental band but with a little bit of vocals. Okay. And I always loved just how ethereal their music was, you know? Yeah. And so Fall of, or 30 Years War, we had another guitar player at the time. Okay. And we were like shooting for that. But as soon as we started jamming and we went and saw a Blood Brothers show or two, yeah. uh, it was like we started screaming over the, over the stuff we were working on and just it kind of developed into that. Um, people in our high school like really supported it. We'd like practice, you know, at my house after school from two to five o'clock. My mom would come home from work at Boeing at five thirty, so everybody had to be gone by, yep. you know, five five fifteen. And uh, but sometimes there'd be twenty five, thirty, thirty five kids like at my house, like in my basement, watching us play music. It's like a little show. Yeah, but it was crazy because it was all kinds of different people in my high school. It was like the cheerleader girls, like some of the football players, the dorks, the goths, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, the hip hop guys, you know, kind of the uh, like the skateboarders for sure. Mm -hmm. But it didn't matter because like we were a rock band and we were like playing shows and stuff, like nothing big, but we were playing YMCA's and and Granges, and once in a while we'd play, you know, Graceland slash El Corazon or, mm -hmm. or Paradox, and like people would come out, our, our high school friends, and, and it gave all these different uh, people in our high school. We went to a big high school, we went to Kamiak High School mm -hmm. in Montecito, and it's definitely like kind of a upscale, more white neighborhood kind of thing, you know? But, uh, it was cool because you could see after a while that we were kind of breaking down the social barriers of like, you know, the football player didn't usually talk to the skateboard guy at school, yeah. but because they were all hanging out, you know, smoking weed together or like, you know, drinking their beers together for a while after school. Like that's just the thing that we did three or four times a week was, you know, Thomas's house like after school is like a little caravan to my house and, yeah and, and we play and we experiment you know with our marijuana or whatever whatever everybody was doing you yeah know? and um, the fall of Troy was like the uniting bond that brought that it, community it was, together it That's really cool. was it really was and like you know not to be big headed but I think you could ask anybody from that time it was just a special time and um, we gave everybody kind of like we were so oddball because we were this yell and scream and kind of progressive crazy band that you couldn't quite put your thumb on. But mm -hmm. like, if you liked Pink Floyd, you liked us. If you liked yeah. Weezer, you liked us. Mm -hmm. If you liked uh, Hendrix, you liked us. If you mm -hmm. liked the Bot or the Blood Brothers, you liked us. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like. But we were also finding our identity through that. You know, like how can we not so much please everybody around us, but make music that still all these people find interesting and support, you know, and we've always had, we always had that local support and then it just kind of took off and it got, kept getting bigger and bigger. But our goal was always just to get the fuck out, you know, as soon as possible and be a touring band. That was like, you know, I, growing up with my dad being a musician, my, my dad always had these gems of advice. Like, you know, if, if you're a real rock star, you're never a rock star in your own hometown, you know? Cause That's a good point. Yeah. Cause, cause, cause everybody knows you and they know who you really are. Yeah. Stuff like that. You know, um, like when you're on the road, you know, take care of yourselves and others and always behave and always be great. You know, I got a tattooed on my thumb. So whenever I'm playing, I'll, once the old man's gone, I'll, I'll, I'll remember that, you know, it's that's a awesome. Reminder. It's a reminder of stuff. And, yeah. uh, but yeah, it just really was cool, you know, and then we started getting out on the road 
and then we we'd, we'd go on the road for a month or two, and we'd come back, and then we'd play a Seattle show, and it'd be like catastrophically bigger that we yeah we'd play a home show and stuff, and it, it was just crazy. It didn't really make sense to us, but at the same time, we felt like we deserved it a little bit just because we were we were working so hard. Yep. You know, like we were we were we were we were giving up having good grades and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, somehow, and then Equal Vision came into the picture and yep. and signed us. And at that time, our other guitar left. Our other guitar player left, and we dropped the moniker The Fall of Troy, or uh, uh, 30 Years War, and we renamed it The Fall of Troy. And that's when we kind of wiped all our old songs, like this EP that we were basically touring on and working off of. Um, we had worked on a few new songs, but it was like, okay, now we need to make a whole new album. Yeah. Know? So we made a whole full length put that out on a record on an indie label called Luho. And then um, shortly after Luho and us, our touring continued to go well and get on better and bigger tours over, you know, that year. Then EVR stepped in and mm-hmm. then we, we got a, we got a, we got, you know, a management deal on the table via, via, via Velvet Hammer who managed Deftones and uh, nice. stuff like that. And we got put on a Deftones tour and a Coheed tour and, mm-hmm. Uh, all that kind of stuff and then all of a sudden there we were kind of playing the big leagues you know and and making records and uh doing and, and doing that kind of thing so that's kind of how that happened but the muppeteer thing now is like you know we've split up a couple of times we've had multiple bass players i just say the fall of Troy is the band that like we just have all the bass players now like anybody yeah. that's played bass for fall of Troy, they're not in the fall of Troy. they're not out of the fall of Troy. it's like they're alumni. They could come there you go. back at any point. You know? Nice. Yeah. Um, Whoever's sitting in for the night. Yeah. Well, it's more like, like our <laughs> new bass player, Henry, he was in Just Like Vinyl with us. And he was okay. Paul Trey's merch guy back then. He's definitely like our bass player now. Yeah. Sorry. Lost it's all good. Um, I have you on these crappy like headphones. No Are worries. You hearing me? Yeah, Are I'm you hearing you me? great. Okay, um, I'm like Jimmy rigging my phone to stand up <laughs> so you can see me. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, Henry just kind of like rose his way up through the ranks as the merch guy, kind of to like the tour manager, to the feed and just like vinyl with me. And then when, mm-hmm. you know, time came, it was like, uh, you sh- you sh- you're the guy for Fall of Troy. And, yeah. like, and our, our fans are amazing because they don't down talk like new members at all. You yeah. know, it's like um, as long as as long as the person's pulling their weight and have a cool personality and and they play the notes and they rock it hard, like people are like I couldn't believe how with open arms Henry was accepted into the band. You know, absolutely. People love Tim. Tim's been in the band twice now, and Frank was great. And we had Drew from Sean for a second. You know, mm-hmm. kind of filling in, um, which is awesome. And, which was awesome. And yeah. then, and now Henry has kind of like established his place as being like the, the full time guy, you know, but he's not on Muckle Tear. Muckle Tear okay. is crazy because it's such an older record. This was before Henry had moved to bass. So half of the record is uh, just Andrew and I, like I'm okay. playing bass on half of it. And then the other half, uh, which are the newer songs, Tim is still was still around at that time. So Tim was part of those four songs. Cool. And I'm, ho- and I'm hoping to have Tim do a vocal, do some uh, guest vocal work on my solo record. So nice. It's just a big incestuous thing where nobody hates ev- anybody, you know, it's yeah. just like, it's just, we're kind of older now and, and people are just kind of do what they got to do uh, at this point. Well, so um, Muckle T Earth is coming out August eighth next week. Um, when uh, can you let us know when your solo album's coming out? Is that uh, announced uh, yet? No, no, I don't okay. have. I don't have a release date for that just because it's been really important to work my own pace with this. For sure. But the fact that this pandemic happened and all this like civil unrest has gone down, um, and me kind of stepping back you know, on social media to kind of make way for some more important, maybe voices to be heard. Absolutely. Uh, And my buddy Dan just kind of, I kind of had a falling out with the guy that I was making it with, because like I said, he's more of like a, 
Like I come prepared, lay it down, da da da. When this is like, no, the creativity happens while it, it's going, you know. And so Dan is Dan is a musician, so he gets excited at these kind of things, like you know when we when we find the right part or whatever. And cool. Um, and we've made we've made leaps and bounds. Like guitars, I think are done. We just need to sit down and go through them all and make sure all all that's done. And then so we'll get into vocals, but. Without, you know, it's a no reason to rush it. It sounds like it's it's the no. uh, it's the journey, man. And it sounds like you know you just and and you know it's your own baby. It's your own thing. So it sounds like you're just having fun with it, which is rad. You're right, but I'm also being very careful with it because it's gonna be my next big push. You know, it's like this is my last big push. Okay, it's like I want to be known as more than just the guitar player from Paul and Troy. It's like. I play bass and drums uh, equally as efficient as I play guitar. And I just want that to be known, you know? And, mm-hmm. and, um, and Andrew, our drummer, he can't tour full time, you know? Um, yeah. And I know that Henry, and Henry plays bass in my solo band as well. Henry, Henry's like my right hand man. He's, he does, he plays bass in everything that I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, we want to be on the road 250 days a year. You know, we want to be back out on the road like once things, once things change again. Yeah. Like, I don't have, I don't do anything than this. This is, this is my career. I don't, yeah. I don't have a regular job, and I don't want to. So, um, I just want to make sure that this record is perfect, you know, and take my time and not be on a timeline, uh, mm-hmm. which I think I've been careful of doing, but. There's also a sense of urgency. I like to push myself. I like to make sure that um, I'm not just going, oh, you know, it'll be done when it'll be done. But because because of the uh, kind of the, the, the halt in the music industry, it gave me the chance to get back in the studio with Dan, you know, yeah. took over the project. And now I can for certain, for certain say that, that this solo album will be coming out next year. Like definitely, definitely, definitely. Because I figure, you know, I'll do the Fall of Troy record and let that do its thing. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, once that kind of starts to, like, kind of fade away, then just hit them with the venom again, you know? Yeah. Like, um, and hopefully kind of spring pad. And by that time, I'm hoping venues will be uh, going or getting ready to go, you know, to yep. the point of where we can we can get out on the road and tour, you know? Because Fall of Troy right now is more of a one-off kind of, or like mm-hmm. we'll do a, a week up and down the West Coast where I want to I want to go do full U.S. tours and full yeah. tours and things like that. Um, and it's just a very strong, in my opinion already, like my, the solo thing I'm working on is very strong. It's very like dark. I got some pretty gnarly like features on this record. Like if all goes as planned, uh, my buddy uh, Chino from the Deftones. Um, Told me Who's that, that? Week. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. He's a good buddy of mine, but he, I sent him a song and I was like, you know, I, I thought maybe you'd like this song, maybe you'd want to sing the hook. And he kind of got back at me like, well, what if I just don't want to sing the hook? What if I just want to sing, sing everything? And if you don't like something, you can, uh, you know, put whatever you want. I'm like, dude, I was like, Tina, listen, man, if you want to, if you want to take, the, if you want to take the whole song yourself, you have all liberty to do that. I yeah. would love if you did that, you know, like, so I talked to him today and he said that he was going to try to get to it uh, here in the next week or whatever. That's badass. And then, um, and then uh, my friend Yvette Young, who's in a band, Covet, mm-hmm. if you've heard of them before. Um, I have not, but I, I trust your opinion. I trust your opinion. They're fantastic. They're like an instrumental band and she's like a total tap amazing guitar player but she makes solo records too that are very dark and piano and she plays violin and she has a fucking beautiful perfect pitch voice cool so i have this really dark almost nine inch nails kind of like ballad really noisy thing that i want to do as like mentality wise like a traditional duet right oh wow yeah but but over a very like very very heavy do me noisy kind of song and then uh back in the day paul troy did a song uh with my friend Rody walker from protest hero called mm-hmm. dirty dirty pillow talk mm-hmm. and i've uh 
I've uh, I've hit him up to to do a version of Dirty Pillow Talk part part two, and he was like, no, nice. no, not part two, part two, because you know, <laughs> yeah, they're French, yeah. they're French Canadian. You got to do it. Yeah, so dude, that's awesome. God, I can't see this, these cables, man. But uh, am I still there? You're still there. I just, uh, I got to see you, man. I, I see your name, but uh, it's all good. This is suspense. Hey, we got okay. you, man. We got you. Awesome. Dude, it sounds awesome. The collaboration sound amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you real quick. So you mentioned that um, your fans, and, and uh, I, I wanted to quickly just mention um, you, you were saying how your fans were so, are so supportive of the new bassists and stuff. And I wanted to quickly mention how you guys have like a cult, like rabid fan base that like your fans are dedicated, which is so yeah. awesome. Um, if, 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 you know, if every musician had uh, the support that, you guys did. I don't think there would be an issue with the recording record industry at all. I think you guys have such a crazy fan base um, that are just so dedicated. Uh, is there anything you wanted yeah. to say to anyone like, you know, out there that's kind of, you know, just, just ge uh, geeked for the new Fall of Troy record and is, is yeah, yeah. watching? Fall of Troy fans and just like fans of my music in general, I don't even like to use the word fan because I think of them as peers because they're all like so many of them, like percentage wise, like 85% of them are super talented musicians themselves, you know, that That's like awesome. they send me their stuff and I'm very impressed and, and they're really funny. And they also like, I've been doing these Twitch stream things and, and now they're getting to know each other via like the chats and stuff. So they are making their own community. That's where I'm becoming friends like via the appreciation for the music and like really that's my whole thing dude is like i want to bring i want to bring different kinds of people together and give them something in common for a little while you know like mm -hmm. if, if i can i feel that's my, that's my duty that's my duty and that makes me happier than anything um that's awesome and uh yeah i definitely don't see them as dorks i think like the fall trade fans are the coolest dorks of We're any all fan dorks. base like i love i love I love our fan base, man, because they, they're such trolls sometimes, but, but they, but they care about the music. Like yeah. They're challenging. They ask challenging questions and they are real. they really want to know. They really want, they want those deep stories. They want those, like, they want to be with the shits, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, big, big time, big time. They, and they, and, and their support level is beyond like, what I can even comprehend a lot of the time. So I'm just shout out to all all the people that follow any of my music and contribute or even pay attention to it because that's it's oh it's overwhelming. It really is. I, there's nothing I can say that would make me sound even cool like enough to to make them feel as cool as I think they actually are, and that's not bullshit. That's amazing, man. And it's it's cool that you 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 recognize that too, and that's that's really that's awesome. Um, I just have a, a couple more questions here for you, man. And um, if you could, uh, why don't you, and, and, and if you could show us on camera, if, if it's not, you know, breaking any rules, pick a scar on your body and tell us the story of how you got that scar. Um, I don't have a lot of scars, but I got a lot of tattoos that are kind of the same kind of deal. Um, I'm trying to think of a scar. I got a scar on my back that I got pushed into a locker once, but uh oh, as far getting as, bullied. As far as like, yeah, getting bullied by a kid that I was friends with, and he felt terrible about it. But you know, like as far as scars go, like tattoos for me, like I, I have blue moon on my knuckles, nice. and um, blue moon stands for um, you know once in a while in a blue you know in a blue moon like it's like it's special you know mm -hmm. I just believe like what I do and what my music is is special, but also it's, it's truly comes from is when my grandparents got married, that was the song they danced to was, uh, was blue moon. So it's That's for my, grand, my grandparents, you know, like all of my tattoos are like scars in a way that they, they all definitely mean something. I don't have too many goofies yeah. running around on my body. Um, That's cool, man. Hell yeah. But, that uh, yes, I have, a, I have a I have a scar you can't see, but it's it's right here, like on the inside of my 
on the inside of my nose and I hit myself in the face with a guitar in um, in Manchester once and like the, the, the tooting peg like had a string that was oh, cut man. all the way and it went into my eye and I had Jesus. to walk, walk across the street to the ER and they shot glue into it because there was no way to bandage it. And um, I had to wear an eye patch for the rest of the tour. And That's luckily, so brutal. Well, and the doctor was like, if you would have hit yourself, you know, a yeah, couple blinded. millimeters to the side, you would have lost your vision absolutely 100%. And, but I don't have any real, like, gnarly scars or anything. But I would just say, like, my tattoos are kind of like my scars, you know? Yeah. They're my reminders. They're my, um, they're, they're my, they're my coloring book of life, I guess. I like that. Yeah. Um well, like again, again, uh, Muckle T Earth is Muckle T Earth is coming out this Friday. Uh, new Follow Troy record, and then we'll be um, looking out for your new solo record, which uh, w- w- uh, keep us updated with, and just follow you on socials, and and we'll yes. uh, we'll follow along with that. So um, there is one more thing. You know yes, that sir. I'm I'm a fan of wrestling, and yes. you said that there were a couple things you wanted to show. Yeah, um, yeah. Hold on. Let me let me grab them real quick. All right, I, I will show you how deep I am with this. Sounds good. Hold on one sec. Yep. So Thomas is, uh, and he was mentioning he's an old school fan of wrestling, and uh, I'm a personally a huge mark for for pro wrestling, whether it be uh, Japan, Japanese wrestling, whether it be WWF, WCW. Uh, I mean, I still watch wrestling. That's how nerdy I am. In 2020, I still watch wrestling. But Thomas was mentioning that he goes back in the day with some old school stuff, and he wanted to show some and memorabilia from back so, in the day. So let's 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 take a look. So I've been I've got a big Bret Hart collection like my whole life. Nice. And I have recently come in. So this one, this one is like I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah. Like this is like Ooh. from uh, Royal Rumble I, or King of the Ring when he run uh, King of the Ring in like ninety five, ninety six, something like that. That's a but nice figure. Is dope because you can you can replace his head, his arms, his hands, stuff like that. Wow. Um, pretty dope my girlfriend hooked me up with that one but the one that's my pride and joy is i got the super limited edition like the all pink oh uh, wow so this is from um royal rumble 1993 uh when he fought razor ramon yeah um and that was the first pay-per-view that i ever um uh, ordered right mm-hmm. and I actually put in a bid on this figure because it it was insanely expensive. That's amazing. I put an eBay um, bid down on it for like 60 or 80 bucks, not thinking I'd get it, right? Yeah. And I had totally forgotten about it, like totally, (laughs) totally forgotten about it. And uh, like a couple months later, I got a package and uh, sure enough, dude, I don't know how, but but I had had won won the raffle of it and... um, it showed up and I, I fucking, I, I broke into tears like a little girl, you know, like it, it was like, cause that match particularly stands out to me as being like, like that was the formative. Like I loved the Hart Foundation back then, like anything Bret Hart's ever done. It's yeah. Like he's, he's my hero, man. But with the all pink dude, like back in that day. You had to like, get it. Dude, I had to get it, but I didn't think I was going to get it. You know? <laughs> I didn't think I had a chance in hell. And I and I and I and I came home from the studio early because my girlfriend was like, "There's a package here. I don't yeah. know like, where it's from." And I kind of was like, "No, that could be a you know like that." Uh, and, like opened it up and I just like that was she it. Video, she has a video of me opening it up and just like freaking out, and, like almost in tears and just like fucking dancing around and like that's amazing. I keep them in the boxes, but once in a while, man, like when I'm. When I'm nerded out enough and I'm like, go back and watch the matches, like I'll fucking crack them out and like mess with them a little bit, but. Put them back in. Yeah. Yeah. I put them back in, but I have, I have, I have wrestling figures dated back to the Hasbro ones, the old Hasbro ones, the plastic ones. Yeah. Like, like I've been collecting wrestling figures since I was a little boy, you know? So, and they just keep getting better and better, man. They do. These these ones are amazing. Yep. The Mattel's. Yeah. Well now it's Mattel again. Yeah, it's you know, crazy. Well, it, it was Mattel. Well, and then they did the Jax figures, which were really eh. crappy. Yeah, I have. I still have a lot of them, but they're not very good. 
I do too. I do too. But they just were goofy. They were like they didn't look like the wrestlers, and and I miss the uh, I miss the old ones. But now now Mattel's taken back over, and they're like yeah. really doing some legit shit. But I mean, they only made like I think like 150, 200 of those. Um, those all pink ones, and it's specifically from that match, which is like my favorite match of his, like ever. And it has like on the back of it, it talks about the match and like what was going on and yeah. all this stuff. And I remember thinking to myself, man, if they could just ever make one figure and they just made that special edition, like 90, 1993 or 1994, one of those few years, maybe 94, like Royal Rumble, like Brett versus Razor, where he wore it all pink with like the polyester pink jacket. And so he never awesome. wore that outfit ever again. Never just again. That one, that one that one Royal Rumble. And it's when they announced the uh, the Caesars Palace uh, WrestleMania yep. was coming up after that one. Yeah. So that was that was that was good years for wrestling, man. So it was cool that cool to hear that you're a big wrestling head. So who's your who's your who's your guy? Who's your go to? You're not gonna like this. I you was a Shawn Michaels that. guy. Dude, okay, here's the thing. Not a big Shawn Michaels fan, but a lot of respect for Shawn Michaels. It's kind of like how I feel about ACDC. Like, ACDC, I could do without hearing it for the rest of my life. But ACDC, so important to rock music that I can't even hate on them. You know, mm-hmm. without them, you wouldn't have so much stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so many things. So I got to have the ultimate respect for acdc i wouldn't ever say like oh i hate acdc and i play sgs you know so yeah so my band loves to give me shit and be like oh ta- you want to know why thomas kevin you want to know why thomas plays sgs because he loves angus and i'm just like sean michaels the acdc of the wwf yeah but yo, like you know you know what Think about how many fantastic matches that he had with Brett mm-hmm. or had with Razor, like ladder mm-hmm. that that first oh, ladder yeah. match. Yeah. Um, I think the very first ladder match. Undertaker was, matches. Was, yep. I think the very first ladder match in WWF was on like um, Saturday Night Superstars still, and it was uh, Brett and uh, Shawn Michaels, and, yep. and 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 people at the time didn't realize, but it totally changed the game. Mm-hmm. Like so. Dude, Shawn I didn't Michaels realize how deep you went with it. Match. Oh, I, I didn't realize how deep we could, you, you should just start a wrestling podcast, man. <laughs> it's been said, it's been said, it's been said. I really love old taker too. Like old Undertaker. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, like old, like late eighties to, to mid nineties. Taker is just, just some of the best shit. You know, iconic. For me. Yeah. Iconic, iconic too. Um, iconic. But that's cool. That's great that you love that shit, man. Cause, uh, you know, in the future, whether we're interviewing or not, you can always hit me up and we can talk some wrestling. And oh, absolutely. I got like I got that. a Bret Hart figure I could send you. What what kind? Funko Pop. Oh, that's that, that that's one that I do not have. I got a Bret Hart Funko Pop for you if you want it. My my buddy's got my buddy works for Funko. Actually, oh, cool. I've, nice. I've been hounding him for one and he always says he's gonna hook me up. But yeah, dude, I'd love to add one of those to my collection. It's like any I have, you don't even want to know how many Bret Hart figures I have, I have man. Like it's, it's, That's amazing. I, it's, 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 it's crazy. But I always just liked his aesthetic, man. I always just liked he, uh, like who else is going to wear pink and black and make it rock that badass? Like just the technical wrestling and kind of going against the grain of yep. like, you know, uh, all this, all this change and all this kind of like, um, even when he got into the, in the attitude era, you know, Bret Hart was like the last great one fighting for wrestling to be kind of wholesome and, he's, still yeah. and stuff like that. He stuck but, up for it. Yeah. But he did a great job and dude, and like, come on the screw job. Like what a fucking drama that was. Man. It's crazy. But some people still think that that whole thing was a work. Do I you know. know <sighs> yeah. Cor- Cornette swears, swears that it wasn't a work, but fucking Jim Cornette. I love Jim Cornette, but some, <laughs> some, there's people that swear that it wasn't a work, but it's also the people that if you would have told them it was a work, they would have blabbed and said it was a work by now, I feel like, too. Right. Like, I feel like, I feel like, like Vince Russo would have, would have totally oh, blabbed. Oh, I hate him. Or like even Jim Ross, Jim, I think Jim Ross, I think Jim Ross knows maybe if it was a work or not. I mean, For sure. I don't, th- I don't think it was a work. It was too real. Yeah. Um, but, Either way, it, 
what a, what a saga that was. Man. That Absolutely. Saga. But, Dude, I'm, I hate to cut the interview, but I literally have 2% left on my laptop. It's about to die. No worries. No worries. Well, no worries. I, think we, I think we've hit most things, man. Dude, we've hit most things, and we went deep in the rabbit hole of WWF, which is amazing. Yes. Dude, yes. Uh, again, Muckle Tear coming out on Friday. Uh, any yep. final words, man? Um, just keep your eyes and ears open. Um, I'm my gun, my, my, uh, proverbial musical guns are loaded. And so, uh, there's going to be a lot of shit coming down the pipeline for me in the next year. So, uh, you know, everybody be ready for that and, uh, buckle up and hang tight because it's going to be quite the ride. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot for the interview, brother. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. I'll talk to you soon, man. Yeah, later, homie. Bye.